Ruth, we're not going to have one guest on today. We're probably going to have, well, I don't know how many we're going to have on. Because... A plethora, a plethora, millions. Absolutely. Well, several, several. We had David Henty, one of the world's top art forgers, on a few episodes ago. Um, we're kind of pushing the envelope a little bit with imitation and mimicry because today we have got one, if not the, uh, greatest impersonators in the world. Um, he can do everyone from politicians to sports stars to famous people in entertainment, musicians, all of those. I can't wait to talk to him. There's so many questions I want to ask him. Uh, it is, of course, Rory Bremner. Now, you're pretty good at imitations yourself. You've done a few, haven't you? I mean, have you? what I really want to know is whether it's a natural talent or whether, whether you can learn it. I mean, we're going to find out everything about yeah, impersonations. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we are. I mean, I'm 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 intrigued because I used to sort of like do them at, do them at school, and and I've sort of had little bits and bobs of, of doing it as an aside and and everything. But this guy is, um, well, he's 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 the master. Different league, isn't he? Yeah, he's yeah, a di so, he's yeah. a different league. I mean, it's a very under researched area in psychology. I'm not aware really of any work that's been done on the psychology of impressions and impersonations. So, um, shall we get him on? Yes. Without further ado. Yep, Rory, welcome to Psycho Schizo Espresso, mate. Rory, seriously, we've been really looking forward to having you on here um, because we we had a didn't we, Bruce? We had a couple of a couple of episodes ago. We had one of the world's great art forgers on, David Henty. Yes, he was brilliant, um, and he was absolutely fascinating about how he gets into the minds of the great masters by painting them and he said something really interesting actually Rory he said that uh I mean Dave Henty is a you know he's a working class fella from 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 London no formal art training uh, and he said something really interesting he said you know when he when you when you kind of really he had an eidetic memory he said for painting he would go up to an old master in a museum he would scrutinize the canvas and then he would rush back to his hotel room with tunnel vision and he would immediately start sketching and he would have this like perfect visual memory of brush strokes, et cetera, et cetera. And he said that when you really get into, you know, art, well, he's an imitator now, not a forger because he's doing it legitimately. He says it's a real back door into the minds of the old masters or any painter that he kind of copies and imitates. And I was just wondering, you know, in terms of, I mean, yourself, when you do imitations and impersonations of people, um, and I'm not, honestly, I'm not blowing smoke up your ass, mate. Honestly, I think you're the best that there's ever been, in my opinion. <laughs> you really, really are. So, um, mm -hmm. w when you do impersonations of people, do you do you find, is there kind of some kind of secret access into their personality that even a psychologist like myself can't get into? Do you well, get who they are? Well, first, that's very kind of you to say those lovely things. But um, I don't know. I think, you know, ideally there is. I remember because I was very lucky because I worked many years ago with John Bird and John Fortune. And I got them on the show. Mm. And John Bird used mm. to do Harold Wilson on um, mm. programs. Like, I wasn't, that was a week that was, but I think it was programs that followed that, maybe the Frost Report or something. And he always, I read something, and this was 30 years ago, and I read him saying, he wanted to get under Harold Wilson's skin that sometimes he felt if he could do to get inside his brain a little bit. So I remember trying to sort of think into the characters. And I suppose the, the most successful was during the Blair years, the Tony Blair years, when we used to improvise a lot. So um, this is before the thick of it. Uh, and we would sort of half write the sketch. But um, Andrew Dunn played Alistair Campbell because we realized each government, each person that you try to imitate, um, you can't use the same tools. I mean, because John Major was different from Thatcher th and John Major was different from Tony Blair and all the rest of it. And it took a while to begin with because Tony Blair was all things to all men. So much so we did a sketch about trying to uh, nail Tony Blair's policies. It was like nailing jelly to a wall. And we actually tried to get a mm. um, one of our um, design people, one of, the, <laughs> one of the props people, to nail jelly to a wall. And guess what? It was completely impossible. So that was very silly. But um, after a while, we realized the whole thing about the new labor it was the relationship between tony blair and alistair campbell and it was just a very and a very tight cabal tony blair alistair campbell uh, gould who was their pollster and peter mandelson uh so it wasn't even gordon brown it was just sort of three or four of them so we used to do things set in tony blair's office where tony blair would be talking with andrew dunn with um alistair campbell rather andrew dunn playing alistair campbell and so we used to improvise and make things up and actually funnily enough it was only when um 
Andy was ke- he kept interrupting me as Alistair Campbell, but because we were improvising and it and it got under my skin, and so I sort of snapped at him, but in the style of Tony Blair. And suddenly there was a little, it was like a spark flying because you were actually it it was you know we were talking to each other in character, and so we carried that on. So it became a kind of it was just it was really improvised acting where we were so into the character that we could he I felt completely at home as Tony Blair he felt completely at home as Alistair Campbell and those sketches worked I haven't really with the characters since it's been about if you get the voice right and then you've got to try and find a line that satirically works for that voice like David Cameron for example if you said I know he said look I mean when I became prime minister they said look are you going to are you going to make the rich richer or are you going to make the poor poorer and I I think we've managed to do both so and that line kind of it, it matched the voice was right but the politics was right so more often than not it's about getting the satire getting the satire right and if you can actually get really into their head and really imagine what they're thinking but after a while you start to own a character you know it becomes totally at home with with donald trump i could talk to you bruce for 10 minutes and i could talk about the days because you know remember when i i was in the band to begin with those first few years and uh, we sang some great songs. We wrote some great albums. And uh, you remember, I remember Bruce, a tremendous gentleman. And you know that you could say anything. I feel totally at home being uh, in character as Trump. So ideally, the best impression is when you you start you start with the voice, obviously, uh, and sometimes it's a little bit tight. It's a little bit too close. It's a little bit too accurate, and it's not got any personality to it. And then over the while, when you become more comfortable with it, start to develop a character and it might be a satirical character or it might be his genuine character, but you sort of, you, you develop a character over time with a voice. And if it, if it's absolutely chimes with that person, then I guess people look at it and the next time they see the real person, the next time they see Tony Blair, they're thinking of the impression. Yeah. 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 Well, because, and that's, uh, but that's, uh, that's, that's a, a great way of uh, of comedic truth telling. Ideally, you you say, um, do you want to get into the head of another character? Ideally, that's the ideal. But really, you start off with a voice, and then you, uh, over time, as you become more relaxed and you become more comfortable with the voice, then you're able to inhabit that character. Mm. And sometimes, to the extent that people, when they next see the real person, the real politician, they kind of so they're thinking of you, they're thinking of the impression. Yeah. But more often than not. Um, you're just, you know, you can do a voice and you want to find a line that fits uh, that voice and um, something that works. So that, so that I think ideally you want people to laugh at the recognition, but you also want to, the laugh, to, to have a laugh and, because you said something that isn't just funny, but it's true and it lands yeah. because people go, do you know what? That's, mm. that's the thing about that character. Yeah. Um, and for Jacob Rees Mogg, you know, you have to do something about somebody who sounds like he might come out of Gilbert and Sullivan. Um, so you have to do a Gilbert and Sullivan song, which I could do for you, which is these are the these are the, the countries in Europe that I can't stand. <clears throat> There's Portugal and Italy and Poland and Romania, the Netherlands and Germany and France and Lithuania, Sweden, Spain and Hungary and Finland and Estonia, Slovenia, Slovakia, and maybe Macedonia. There's more to Belgium, Greece, the Czech Republic and Croatia, and Luxembourg and Cyprus, which is practically in Asia, and Austria and Latvia and Denmark and Bulgaria. And Ireland and if Turkey joins the whole thing gets but scarier. But now we're out of Europe and no longer be inferior. We're even doing trade deals with Burundi and Liberia. They tried to stop us leaving, which was perfectly absurd of them. It's what the British public voted for. At least a third of them. So that's a character in a plausible setting making a political point. How do you remember the words, Rory? I mean, how do, I mean it's how I remember the EU now. Wow. Somebody says, oh, right. know, somebody says to me is Croatia in the or is Malta in the EU. I have to go through the okay. Uh, the, yes, the, yeah. The, yeah. The, 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 oh yes, it is. Point is get a voice. Yeah. If it's a joke, it's fine. Find what's going on. I mean, politically, I was I had to work out what's happening. I think what's I'm going to make sense of stuff, and then you can make nonsense of it. That's what's yeah. going on in terms of the material. In terms of the voice, I think it's largely instinctive. Yeah. But I mean, we go back to the very beginning about you know the psychology of impressions, and mm. you know I started off at school, and there's two things going on there. Yeah. Firstly, because if you can do the teachers, um, yeah. it's inherently yeah. satirical because people love to see authority being sort of generally undermined. 
because yeah. you feel you've kind of sort of got control over them a little bit, you know, and if people can laugh, if you can make people laugh about the teacher. And that's and the, ironically the very first impression that I did successfully and publicly was Derek Swift. And he was he was a teacher that changed my life actually in many ways. He was fantastic. He was a slightly maverick. Um he was very <laughs> was an, he was an English he was an English public school boy, so why this guy with the quite sort of quite strongly northern accent and he would he would shout, Oi, infant he called us infant. <laughs> he was the person who suggested we didn't have a dining hall at school, but we should just have a large trough outside. Yeah. So um, he, he was he was kind of kind of maverick, but he taught us French and German. French. Um, he had twenty four in the class, twenty two got A's at O level. He taught ah. us Russian in his spare time and in our spare time, and it was a class. It was like like the History Boys that class. There were six of us that sort of, as I say, went on to do Russian. Anyway, his reward that he became the first impression that I did in public, wearing a duffel coat like his and, and dressing up like him and, and, wow. and introducing the films as he used to do. But back to school, and it's it, the two things I mentioned. One was the fun of doing teachers and therefore being able to undermine them. And the other thing is, as I recognise as I get older, as uh, the ADHD part of it, because that's ah. something which I've uh, recognised in myself. I saw it in a relative of mine you know, many years ago who was then diagnosed, and I thought this really does chime and it's the my own psychological make it so ir irrepressibility um slight um inattention so i can sort of wander off or be easily distracted mm. um they call it attention deficit hyperactivity mm. disorder but actually it's attention surfeit you're paying attention to too many things yes yeah, it's, it's, the it's the attentional filter exactly. so, yeah that's right and, yeah, and yeah. Is, i think this is the thing psychologically it's really exciting about comedy because I, if it, because the great thing is the science is catching up with ADHD. It was used to be thought Definitely. of as something moral, somebody who's badly behaved, a child who's badly behaved, bad parents, and just somebody who's unruly, sort of morally and then behaviorally. And then the, the there was an American teacher, of course, who started to give his kids speed, you know, Bethel Fennett. Yeah, you know, that's right. Uh, yeah. And ironically, it got them going. It, it revved their engines up. So instead right. of being hyperactive to get going, yeah. their dopamine levels were already, that's you know, right. it, it got them going. But now as science is catching up and you can see brain scans and they now see that if you look at an ADHD child, you can see that there are whole parts of the brain which are underdeveloped, haven't developed, haven't turned up yet. Yeah. And here's the kicker. Those are the parts of the brain that actually regulate impulsivity. They stop you mm. from being impulsive and they're not there. So, and you wonder how many comedians, um, I guess how many musicians as well, Bruce, because people mm -hmm. can be incredibly creative. But I wonder if ADHD is part of their makeup. Uh, first of all, because it is a gene that is selected for. Sure. This isn't, hasn't been bred out. As a professor said to me, Eric Taylor, he said, you know, we're, we're the ones who eat the poison fruit. So you have these creatives, whether they're musicians or particularly um, comedians, who get who they're, they're buzzing, their minds are buzzing uh, creatively because they've got restless brains. And the part of their brain that's supposed to say, no, that's not appropriate, is not there. The filter isn't there. So it looks like they're incredibly quick thinking when they get to an idea quickly, but they get to that idea and they don't close it down. Well, especially in, in a... especially improvisation, Rory, I would imagine. Oh, um, I mean, that's where it would really kick mm. in, wouldn't it, I suppose? Well, I think if we talk about psychological experience, um, there's a brilliant group called Showstoppers who improvise a musical, I don't know if you've ever seen them. And they no, are, I, haven't, no. I, I saw them a couple of nights at Edinburgh because each show is different. Um, yeah. And the speed of thought, there's one, yeah. uh, Ruth Bratt, uh, she was, they were given as a subject inside a saxophone. So the whole thing had to take part inside a sax saxophone. I think, God, how are they going to make this work? And Ruth came out and she developed this character as the middle notes. She said, I'm the middle notes, not too high, not too low, just mellow in the middle. And she became this character, Raquel, who was the middle, night, middle notes. And then she said, she decided she'd had enough. And this sax player had a really big gig coming up. She said, well, maybe I won't turn up. Maybe I won't turn up tonight. And so he had a deal. They had to make this song up about him making a deal with the middle notes of his saxophone. And then, so she wow. stayed with him for that night and she stayed with him. And then she said, you know, she realized that she he was just using her. So there was this scene. And don't forget, they are improvising this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so then there was this scene where she says, you know, I was so full. How foolish I was to think that I was, I meant something to you. And. And and then she sang this song about I may be just notes on a stave, but I have a heart. And the all on the spur of the moment, just, unbelievable. All yeah. the spur of the moment. And yeah. then so she said she walked away, she left him, and he had his big gig. This is your big gig. You gotta work. And he didn't have the middle notes. And so he was on the stage and failing. And then suddenly she just appeared behind him. And the audience was going, She's come back. Oh, she's gonna <laughs> and so 
what I'm so that's just an, how she and I thought yeah. and I thought you if you could wire up as a psychological expert if you could wire up the brains of improvisers um because obviously and it is an absolute you know they they train for it as well because if you can't just come to improvisation cold and because they've got brains that work in this particular way and I'd, I'd be fascinated so the psychological point of this is how much yeah. is uh, not having a filter how much is speed of thought how much is um, quick brain and impulsivity uh, how much is that part of a psych of a, of a comedian's and an improviser's makeup Rory have you I mean when you look back at, at, at your life you know when you were at school I mean how, how long have you have you known that that you've you've had ADHD and, and when you look oh, back and you've had that kind of that label does 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 it kind of put things in perspective well, I kind of, does everything kind of I make kind of sense s- now yeah, it, it makes sense. I, I kind of stuck the label on myself. And sometimes right. when people say about diagnosis, I say, well, actually, it's not going to tell you anything that you don't already know. Because almost like if you're asking the question, if you sort of think, I think I should get, I think I've got ADHD. I think it's, it's, it's because you've recognized um, that. But we all, we're all on the spectrum to some extent. Yeah. Know? We all can have times where we're, we're forgetful or uh, we're disorganized or whatever. But so the thing with ADHD is it, generally it comes to a stage where they talk about impairment when it impairs your ability to hold down a relationship mm. or to hold down a job or because it just gets in the way and i've been lucky because it's it's i've been able to find a lifestyle and this is one of the ways you manage it as opposed to cure it is you find a lifestyle or you find a vocation um or if i a career where it's an asset rather than a liability um so i've been lucky in that respect i'm just when you were at school i mean you you wouldn't yeah. have been aware that adhd well, was no I, I was aware of the there was the impulsivity. I, was, I remember yeah. at school once robbing. Um, I was uh, we were playing football or whatever. Uh, we were, there was at school we played rugby, and we played football because the grounds grounds were, were frozen. And I remember bearing down on goal, and we our, our centre forward had the ball, um, and I tackled our own centre forward and oh, shot right. at the goal and missed it by about twelve feet. But and I think look back and think why did I do that? And I can remember then everyone saying why did you do that? Did you have and a betting syndicate moment. going? Did you have we're running we're running a book or <laughs> something? Well, no. Nowadays they get VAR or something. Yeah. Right. Oh, they were, but but now I look at it and there's, and why I did it was because ADHD was it there it was an act yeah. of complete a moment of of in, totally impulsive madness and there it was yeah you wanted, to, you, you wanted to see what would happen oh i, I just i just, oh, it was, it was, it was totally, <laughs> wonder what happens if i do this oh, it was totally impulsive um so there was a, and then of course i think about university always talking i'm even doing it now unfortunately i'm sort of talking too mm. much but in seminar seminars and you think and you don't you can't bear silences there's a wonderful story about edith evans being at a play and she went with a director and she said i don't know what to, i don't know what to do during this pause and the director looked at the script and said, so what, Nothing. So, well, what, 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 what pause? And she said, the pause while that man's speaking. <laughs> Her brain was going at such a rate that she couldn't even, even when the, the guy sort of hesitated deliberately in the middle of his speech, that was too much for her. She had to jump in. And that's the yeah. imp- impetuosity part of it. Bruce, yeah. I'm wondering about you and ADHD. Have you ever thought about it? Yes, yes. It's something I thought I should, maybe I should give it a try one day. You know? <laughs> <laughs> See what happens. See what happens, you know. I mean, no, I mean, I, I think uh, if, if you were to go and uh, pick me on a on a bit of a spectrum, I think I'd probably be, uh, I'd, I'd probably be along the way there. But I'm not. Um, it doesn't impair me particularly because um, I've been able to do things that I know that uh, were were a little bit alien to me. But at the same time, I did I did things. Because they were a bit alien. So, for example, you know, I you know I learned to fly, um, which was uh, good fun. I thought I thought the flying bit of it was fantastic, you know. And then somebody said, "Well, there's all these rules you have to obey." I went, "Oh no, that's tedious." Mm. Well, I did the flying bit's really fun. What do you mean you have to obey rules? Anyway, then I ended up becoming an airline pilot. So, being an airline pilot is completely rule based and um, and and very specific. And the sort of thing that if you were really really along you know, along the spectrum, a long way, you couldn't possibly cope with doing it because, you, you know, you, you, you just crack up under the stress of having to obey the rules and there's a, a, a set text that you have to follow. There are, you know, rigorous procedures and all the rest of it. And I, um, <clears throat> I kind of embraced it almost like an out-of-the-body experience when I was doing it because mm-hmm. I was kind of almost watching myself do these things, going, this is not actually kind of, natural to who you are but actually you can do this and actually when you do this 
you're actually quite good at it. I mean, I was a trainer. <laughs> you know, I used to train people in these procedures and things like that. And it was fun because um, at the same time as I could step, put one foot into that world, I had another foot in entirely different worlds that people used to look at me like I had two heads because I did, you know, because they'd say, I, we don't understand. How can you, how can you one minute be in a uniform flying passengers to Sharm El Sheikh on the 737 and getting up at three in the morning and then doing all this stuff and blah, blah, blah. And then just go and, you know, next month, go and put on a pair of like plastic leather trousers and jump around like waving your willy at people. I mean, how can you, how can you reconcile those two things? You know? And I Why said, well, at the same time, <laughs> well, I did. No, I did. No, I did. Kevin, Kevin, are you enjoying this episode? I'm absolutely loving it, Bruce. The thing is, um, is that most people won't get to hear a lot of this episode because they, yeah, they're not, they're not Patreons and, and, but we've extended that whole thing now. So if you want to hear, uh, this the content that we're going to do in the next bit and the kind of unfiltered version, well, of any of the podcasts, really. Um, yeah. You can get it on the Patreon page and you can also get it now on Spotify subscriptions, I do believe. Um, you just search for the Psycho Schizo Espresso Double Shot and it's... Um, it. How much is it? Two quid a pop, isn't it? Is it two, two quid a pop, quid, something like two that? Two quid a pop, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. it's two quid. Unedited, unfiltered, yeah. Uncensored. <laughs> <laughs> anything but anything but uneventful. Anything but uneventful. Yeah, if you can say it's the hardcore, hardcore stuff. You won't regret it, folks. Do you know it's funny actually yeah. as you mentioned flying, Bruce, because there was, bring it back to a bit of psychology, there have been studies done on pilots making announcements. And there is oh, yes. a definite pilot intonation. Oh yeah, uh, which oh Nigel been... and oh yes, and, uh, hello. And there's, there's a Nigel two peaking from twenty thousand feet, and I know that nobody in the back actually gives a shit at the moment. But we are um, in the blackness uh, below. You can see absolutely nothing, but I can assure you that underneath all that cloud is Bognor Regis, and we'll be making a uh, left hand turn to Bognor Regis before making a right hand turn onto the left hand runway at London yeah. Gatwick, <laughs> where we should be arriving, uh, uh, God permitting, and uh, weather, and hopefully the undercarriage comes down. But in the event it doesn't. Don't worry, we've always got another one. And of course, uh, if uh, the uh, oxygen mask should deploy, um, just make sure that you uh, uh, use your own before the person sitting next to you. So if they turn blue, just uh, just ignore them. All right. <laughs> well, I'd, love I mean, to hear, uh, I'd love to hear one of those pilots' messages and at the end yeah. of it say, and for the interest of passengers, I'm currently working from home. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the, the intonation, what the studies have revealed, is that they speak, as you just did there, Rory and you, they speak much slower than you would in mm. usual conversation. And of course, this is meant to build confidence. Uh, so lots of studies yeah, have been looked at. A that. certain amount of da, 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 yeah. the, the yeah. reassurance in the voice. Yeah. Will be yeah. Like but it just puts you to sleep. Yeah. But then, you, yeah, so that's reassuring. <laughs> but it's interesting how in, to, in politics and in comedy, that's happened because there's a brilliant comedian called Jeremy Hardy who sadly died a couple of years ago, and he was just wonderful. But he was on the cabaret circuit in the 1980s, and he developed a kind of delivery like this. He'd say, you know, things like, people say I'm very self-deprecating. I don't think I'm very good at that, to be honest. And it was very sort of downplayed, downbeat. So, yeah. And suddenly you noticed a lot of other comedians on the circuit doing comedy, but using the same intonation. Politically, Tony Blair, the way that Tony Blair speaks. And then you look at politicians since Tony Blair, and you can see his... Um, his intonation, you can see his rhythm, and that's something mm. you know, the impressionists pick up. Um, and it's it it's just it it may be kind of subliminal, but it's people they they look at that and they they think I that's what that's what I should be like, that's what I should project. Mm. And I don't think it's even a conscious thing, but I, I certainly think that people can appear on the public stage and be in the public consciousness to such an extent that people start to imitate them. Do you know what, Rory? You'll That's love this. There was a study done last year, uh, well, actually 2020, which looked at lawyers in courts. And oh. they found that lawyers that uh, mimicked judges' communication styles in, tone, in terms of tone and delivery won more cases than lawyers that didn't. Um, That's fascinating. Yeah, it is. So just mirroring. Um, if a lawyer mirrors a judge's tone uh, and delivery style, they win more cases. And there's also been studies done 
um, with uh, waiters in restaurants. And if you repeat a customer's order back to them, something as simple as that, right at the beginning of a meal, you get more tips than if you don't repeat the order back. So Isn't there's all these little fascinating mimicry things which have been studied in psychology, which is exactly what you're saying. We but, were talking about uh, Burley about being the, the empathy. Yeah. I think it's um, uh, being, having it. an yeah. um, empathic um, yeah. ability. But I think comedians have that too, I think, in terms of there's a bit of a debate going on about because um, um, Liz Truss taking over and a comedian who's being wonderfully, very funnily, satirically um, sarcastic. And people say, oh, should comedians be on these political shows? But I think, and I said, so, well, of course we should because comedians look at things in a different way and comedians can say mm. what people are thinking because, the, the, you know, we have a, a, an insight, we have an empathy. And if you have to look at, the, you know, the most um, praised comedian and politician at the moment, Zelensky. Zelensky started as a comedian. Yeah. Part of his makeup is his empathy, his ability yeah, sure. to communicate, his ability to relate to his audience. And, and of course, I'm not saying that every comedian is a Zelensky, but I'm saying that there's something in that makeup that yeah. makes him suitable, that makes him the right man in that in that position. Um, so, I mean, there's there's so many sort of elements, of, but, but I think that comedians and uh, impressionists as well, um, you know, we were just wondering about whether this is part of the makeup, that if you... If you if you if you do impressions of people, I think is do you sort of like them? You don't have to like them because obviously I do impressions of people I can't stand. But I was going to ask you. You that, begin actually. as a fan. Yeah. You begin. I I, well, yeah. I began okay, as a yeah. fan watching, you know, watching cricket and uh, watching Richie Benno, who oh, was Richie a Benno. great commentator who uh, <laughs> was very dry. He used to say, yes, uh, there's uh, Glenn McGrath out for one, just ninety nine runs short of what would have been a remarkable century, and, and he was right. So, I, but but I did these people, and those these are the first impressions I did at school because yeah. I was a fan. I loved them, and I I, I really used to um, enjoy enjoy that. One of the ways you can show people that you're getting on well with them is you fall into their rhythm. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever? I was going to say, have you ever been tempted? to um, use your amazing powers to kind of to, 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 to like do a little political prank. Have you ever have you ever felt like picking the phone up to someone, well, I don't know, Tony Blair or, <laughs> or Barack Obama or, or even Donald Trump and, you know. Or even Donald yeah. Trump, it could be. Well, no, there were yeah. two. Back in the, when we started the series in 1984, um, was it 84? No, sorry, it wasn't. It was 92, around 92, we went to Channel 4 and we needed to sort of, Pushed the envelope a little bit. We wanted to push the boundaries. Thought, what'll we do? We thought, we'll do some hoax calls. Now, John Major was prime minister, and I don't if you can imagine a situation where a Tory prime minister is having a hard time about Europe because his backbenchers are Eurosceptic. <laughs> I don't know if you can imagine. So, but anyway, I was I was in the middle of that, Kevin. Um, hard to imagine, Bruce, but that there I was, and he'd gone abroad somewhere, and we thought, okay, let's ring up backbenchers, the people he'd described as the bastards. Let's ring them up as John Major and give them a hard time. So we rang them up. First time the tape didn't work. The second time it was a guy called Richard Body. And he took the call. John Fortune said, uh, Sir Richard, I've got the Prime Minister on the line. Oh, put him through. Right, Richard, what have you been saying behind my back? <laughs> we had this conversation. Um, there was no script. No script. But um, at the end I said, well, I, listen, I want your support. I want you to come to the Conservative Party conference and I want you to dance with me on the last night. Just making it up. Totally made it. Uh, anyway, call ended. And then we thought, can we use that? We realised we couldn't use it without his permission. But that made it all just far too tame. So we were thinking what to do about it. Meanwhile, in Westminster, alarm bells were ringing because people were reporting conversations with John Major, which they knew <laughs> hadn't taken place. So Major got his cabinet secretary, Richard Butler, Robin Butler, Robin Butler <laughs> to look into it. And uh, cut a long story short, they got to Michael Grade and Michael Grade got to us and the tape went back to... Um, anyway, what we didn't know was that Richard Body, who I'd spoken to, was the ringleader of a of a proposed coup against John Major at the party conference. He was the ringleader. Uh, paranoia. But because he'd spoken to, inverted commas, John Major, he called it off. He called it off. He said, no, I've spoken... He said, no, I've spoken to John Major. Anyway, when they rang... He wants to dance with me. Exactly. Yes, exactly. He changed the course of history. I don't know how he glossed over that. But anyway, yes, so they said to him, you know, you spoke to John Major. Yes, yes. Well, it wasn't John Major. He said, oh, don't be ridiculous. Don't be ridiculous. And this is the quote. I've got it on the government documents because it came out under the 30-year rule or whatever. It came out, you know, 20, 30 years ago when they could release the documents. They said, look, it wasn't the Prime Minister. He said, oh, well, look, if he denies it now, 
he goes down in my he goes down in my estimation. Down in my that estimation. Call, that call has saved his bacon. So I was I looking. Didn't... I was looking forward to rubbing my trousers <laughs> against his trousers, like I did sort of that sort of thing at school, you know. Oh, yes, yeah. and we did it for more than bacon. I can tell you more now. Than bacon, I can tell you. So he, um, but yes. that's the thing. So he, um, so I didn't stop Brexit, oh. but I might have slowed it down. So that's no matter how satirical you think you'll be. Yeah. Um, you know, the real life has a way. So I didn't know it was a rebellion. So maybe we stopped that, stopped Brexit for a while. But, and the other one was ringing up. Um, we had to do it the other way around uh, in 2005, I think, the election. Uh, and I rang up Margaret Beckett, pretending to be Gordon Brown. And I said, sorry, sorry how, how's, <clears throat> how, how's, how's it going? Oh, hello, Gordon. And we had this chat. And so I said, so who, who do you think we should have in the cabinet? And we had a talk for about three or four <laughs> minutes about who should be in the cabinet. And she said, well, like, she wanted to keep her job. And we said, uh, Patricia Hewitt. Um, so I know I, 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 she, she, I don't think she's very good. No, yes, that's what I've been hearing. And we had a chat. And then I hung up. And of course, the producer and the lawyers went, oh, no, you can't use that. <laughs> and we we had to sit on it for a few days so the answer to your question is yeah and it is a great device um in some ways when it is like rather like safe cracking and you suddenly find yeah. you're in the safe and you think oh my god what am i going to do yeah. now i i sometimes regretted that i didn't go for i didn't sort of ring up george bush as david frost because i knew david was a great a great friend of the, of the bush family and i could have i could have rung up said george do you really do you really want to invade iraq um, or whatever. I think um, in moments in history, I suppose if you'd been an impersonator working in the 30s and you could have rung up sure, um, yeah. uh, the German high command as Hitler and told yeah. them that you did to call something off or, or yeah. um, I don't know, you know, it'd be nice. But you have to, um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not the easiest thing. It's, it's quite a, when you're right, when you're in the middle. And of course it can yeah. go very wrong. A hoax call, some um, Australians, they rang up the hospital where I think the queen was staying in and they got managed to get through and talk to the queen um, pretending, I don't know who they were pretending to be, but um, anyway, but the nurse, it was just a nurse on the switchboard who put them through and she was, she, she killed herself because she was so, so in, in a sort of, she was so remorseful that she'd allowed this oh, blind, thing to happen. Yeah. It wasn't her yeah. fault at all, but so yeah. just get, you know, you've got to be careful with hoax calls and yeah. when they work and they do, they can be very funny, but um, yeah, you know, Rory, I've got a friend of mine who's who's a hairstylist, and and she goes around <laughs> and she's been a hairstylist for thirty years, and she kind of is always looking at people's hair, and oh, there you go. Have you had a haircut, Bruce? Have you had a haircut, there, mate? Um, yeah, it so was yeah a little bit. Yeah, so uh, I chopped I chopped a bit I chopped a bit off. Yes, because oh, right. it was getting unruly. I mean, it sort of it becomes, it oh, becomes right. a bit sort of like. Privet, privet hedge. Is it? it still grows? Oh, that's right. the that's the annoying thing about it. It's still growing. You know. Okay. This is a very classic On the other AD, hand, ADHD interruption to your question. Kevin. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'm <laughs> going to forget what I asked him. But no, I've got I've got a friend of mine who's got a head proof of life. People's proof hair. Of, proof of life. She's looking at people's yeah. hair and going, oh yeah, that's you know whatever. I've got a friend of mine who's a dentist. He's always looking at people's teeth. So obviously the question Quite is horrible. when you when you're in every, you know, everyday life, you're going to a restaurant, going to a bar, whatever, walking down the street, and you hear someone. Are you, do you have a kind of an internal register of voices? You think, oh, that's an interesting one. I haven't heard that one before. I mean, when you listen to me and Bruce, can you? Are you thinking, oh, he's got that. Kev's got that going on. Bruce has got that going on. Have you got this kind of internal register that you're always computing and analysing voices? I think maybe when I was younger, a bit more so. But now I realise, like so many things in life now, as you get, I realise it's something I sort of switch on and switch off. Right. Uh, it may yeah. be because you know, if your brain is in broadcast or receive mode. That if I'm listening to somebody, um, I think there's two things going on. It's when you learn voices, you've got to listen to somebody and you've got to kind of, so you can hear how they're speaking, mm. uh, but in a sense, but not listen to what they're saying in a sense. And, and you know, yeah. sometimes I'm just listening to what they're saying and I'm not really analyzing the accent. Um, so, uh, you know, if you said to me now for the next five minutes, just, just concentrate on how I'm speaking and that I would think of you in that way. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. As I say, so, I mean, I'm not sure it wasn't instinctive when I was younger, but now it definitely, I switch it on, switch it off. Unless there are some are voices, which, you know, they really do jump out at you when it's a very silly voice, <clears throat> you know, like somebody like William Haig many years ago and his voice, that voice <laughs> appeared and you thought that's a voice that I would like to do. Um, or, and so, you know, you'd be very grateful um i mean i suppose for some you know, i've been grateful for boris johnson because i mean for, for, for sort of two or three years you had a voice i always i always wish people recognized and i could play you you know 
people like cabinet ministers like Dominic Raab over here. Or yeah. Half the, and I, I if you played the played a tape of them and said who the, who are they people wouldn't know who they are but if you play a tape of Donald Trump or if you play a tape of Prince Charles or mm. a tape mm. of then people recognize and that's the key people do have to recognize and then you think well psychologically what's going on why do people enjoy impressions and I think yeah it's a great question I was going to ask you that yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it's partly, it's, I think I, I spoke about this with, um, um, I don't know if you've read Jonathan Miller, and um, we try to um, analyze. And partly, I think there's a thing about that voice shouldn't come out of that mouth. Yeah, that's you right. Know, how is how is that voice making that sound? Um, yeah. So there's this sort of technical kind of people that admire the virtuosity of it. Yeah. Uh, and then, as I say, secondary, it, it's, it, you know, people enjoy it because it's a sort of undermining of authority. It's a bit naughty. Yeah. It's a bit satirical all of those things. And thirdly, I think he mentioned this, the, the, that character, um, was it Han van Megeren, who was a forger. I know you talked about forgers oh, yeah. previously on the series, mm. uh, but he used to forge Vermeers and he sold them to the Nazis. He sold one to Goering and, um, he was arrested after the war and sort of tried for selling off Dutch property. And it's a wonderful thing how he went from sort of, you know, potential criminal to hero because they said, well, you sold this Dutch property to, to the Nazis. He said, no, 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 it was a fake. I ripped them off. So they said, oh, fantastic, great. Um, they still <laughs> put him on trial and sadly he, he died while he was still on trial, oh. unfortunately. But um, the story, as Jonathan told it, was that afterwards they looked at, when they knew they were fakes, they looked at, the, the, at, the, at his Vermeers and they said, well, no, that obviously is not a Vermeer because they could see the mistakes and there's something that people want to mm. read they want if they want to believe that they're hearing a certain voice they will and they'll kind of um sometimes uh you know they'll they'll accept an impression you want somebody say oh it doesn't doesn't sound very much like me uh there's a wonderful example the other day chris barry many years ago actually chris barry he did russell harty who was an Amer who was a mm. british chat show host yeah and uh, they wanted him to do an advert, but uh, they thought, well, we won't get him in to do the test. We'll get Chris Barry in. So Chris came in and he did, he did Russell Harty, um, talk about advert for biscuits or whatever it was, doing an impression of Russell Harty. And so they said, that's great, lovely, we love that. So they passed the test and they then they got the real Russell Harty back for the for the main <laughs> thing. And they said, when he did it, they said, it does, yeah, they said, that doesn't sound anything like Russell Harty because yeah. the impression <laughs> yeah. sounded more like Russell Harty because yeah. that was the one I said a few minutes ago yeah. about how you know, if an impression really works, it's because in some way when the next time people see that person, all they can yeah. think of is the impression. You were going to say about Vincent Price though, Bruce, what was your Vincent Price? Yeah, no, no, no. Vincent Price was talking about the, uh, you know, the, the real thing or not the real thing. So we did again, but, but, we had an album called Number of the Beast, and we uh, we wanted to have a quote from the Book of Revelations, you know, woe to you of earth and sea, for the devil sends the beast with wrath, for he knows. And we went, right, that's it, got to be Vincent Price. So we phoned up uh, Vincent Price's uh, agent. And said, Look, we, we want to, you know, uh, we want, bit, we want this guy to, 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 Vincent Price to read read the voice, you know. And um, the guy goes, I'm, I'm afraid Mr. Price won't get out of bed for less than 10,000 pints. Um, and we went, oh, well, shit. We were thinking more like a couple hundred quid. <laughs> ah, bugger. Uh, so um, anyway, I, I, at the time, Capital Radio was very different to how it is now, radio station in London. And, um, and they had a ghost story every night at midnight. And I used to listen to the ghost story, a little 15-minute ghost story. And there was a chap who used to read the ghost story. And I thought, bugger me, he's a dead ringer for Vincent Price. So we phoned him up. And he said, oh, yes, a, a, a couple of hundred pounds. That'll do nicely. Um, you know, equity. Oh, right, great. Yes. Came down, read it brilliantly five times. That was it. Job done. And to this day, people swear blind, it is Vincent Price. How wonderful. You know. A few years ago, yeah. I remember interviewing. I went round to his house. He didn't live too far from where I was in Chipping Norton. interviewed Robert Hardy um, because yes. I wanted him to, um, uh, fill out a questionnaire on behalf of Winston Churchill, because oh, uh, yes. Hardy How obviously wonderful. portrayed Winston Churchill many times was a huge admirer of Winston Churchill. Um, and so I wanted to find out, um, whether Winston Churchill was a psychopath, uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, there's questionnaires which measure that. Uh, so obviously Winston Churchill said, can't ask him. So I thought I'd do the next best thing and ask Robert Hardy uh, to do it on behalf of Winston Churchill because he knew Winston Churchill very, very well. I haven't played him all these years. And um, Robert Hardy, I spent three wonderful hours with Robert Hardy's company. Uh, he's a fantastic guy. And um, he was in character for that entire time. 
And he oh, did admit, wow. he'd, and then he filled out the questionnaire oh. on behalf of Churchill. It turned out that Churchill was a borderline psychopath, actually. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, uh, but Robert Hardy said that sometimes he really struggled himself. And he was in his 80s when I, when I spent some time with him. And we, we, we kept in contact for quite a while, actually, until he died. Uh, but he, he did admit that sometimes he lost track of where he ended and Churchill began. Oh, wonderful. Um, I wonder if you could get yeah. around the Goldwater rule that way. You could say that you're allowed to actually, if you've, if you've, well, if you've had, had a, a really good impersonator in your, in your um, surgery. Yeah, and you've examined mm-hmm. them. Well, if you can then see, Rory, see I, the real I did actually come. I'm I did actually, I did actually come. Uh, I did actually come up against the Goldwater Rule uh, back in 2016. So Scientific American, because uh, what I started doing, because I'm um, very interested in psychopaths, and that's one of my areas of psychological expertise is is, is psychopathic personality. And um, I started looking at famous historical personages and whether they were where they were on the psychopathic spectrum. So. Um, Robert Hardy and Winston Churchill were part of that. But I got some of the world's top biographers. Um, so I was at Oxford University at the time to fill out questionnaires on behalf of their subjects. So I read Gen- everyone from Gendis Khan, Idi Amin, et cetera, et cetera. And, and <laughs> Whoa. Basically, Scientific American asked me, well, could I do the four um, electoral nominees for the election in 2016? So they had Trump, Cruz, Sanders and Hillary Clinton. Uh, and so I got journalists who knew them very, very well. Um, uh, BBC, a couple of BBC journalists actually to fill out the questionnaires on behalf of Trump and all this and that. And then, of course, it became it became a big cover feature in Scientific American um, and news got round about America. And I think it was a, might have been the New York Times or something like this. And the journalist had said, you're breaking the Goldwater rule. You are diagnosing somebody you haven't met. And I got round it by saying, actually, I'm not diagnosing anybody psychopathy is a personality variable that varies naturally in the general population and there's no diagnosis about it. Um, and uh, they did apologise. The paper did apologise. Um, my favourite, that's wonderful. My yeah. favourite actually is, and you look come across this, both of you guys, this is why it's fun doing this particular podcast. My favourite is the Dunning-Kruger thing. You know about Dunning-Kruger? Do you know about this? No, go on. No. Oh, wow. No. Dunning-Kruger. Now, okay, so Dunning was the professor and Kruger was his, um, his research assistant and it was research into, into stupidity. And the, the, what came out of this was that stupid people don't know that they're stupid. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And how they did this was they rigged up a series of tests and what they, they got people and they rigged up an exam, a test about something that they didn't know anything about. Okay. So they had to fill in this test about something that they really, they had no expertise on. They just had, a, and then, but the key thing is after the test, they would then say, so how do you think you did? And the people, mm. uh, they're, they're intelligent, the brighter people, they would say, well, look, I don't know anything about this. You know, maybe got, pfft, I've only got two out of 10, right? Or sort of maybe, maybe got five, four out of 20 or something like that. But I don't know. But the stupid ones would go, I think I did very well. I think I did really well. I think I got most of the questions right. <laughs> I can't resist doing it in Trump's voice, but you know where I'm going. No, no. I know, I know. And this was the thing, and this was their guide to, and it's fascinating. I mean, do look at Dunning-Kruger. Yeah, look it so up. Yeah. And my favorite, and so it was, it was the idea that if you're, if you're stupid, you don't know how stupid you are. Um, and my favorite was a guy who, um, he robbed a bank in Pittsburgh, but he had taken into his head that the, he knew that the key ingredient of invisible ink, invisible ink was lemon juice, right? So he, <laughs> Bruce is laughing already. <laughs> so he covered his face, wrong? he covered his face with lemon juice. <laughs> And then, this is true, and he took a picture of Polaroid, presumably, presumably he couldn't see where he was shooting, and so he's just oh. a wall behind him. Got, I, I can't see myself, I can't see. So anyway, he, so he goes off to rob a bank, and he's covered in lemon juice. And of course, it's picked up on the CCTV cameras, the cops are at the door, they catch him coming out, and, and they arrest him. <laughs> and all he can say is, but I, I, I wore the juice. I wore the juice. <laughs> and you think, actually, then he could jump to Trump and say it was not lemon juice, but it's orange juice. But yeah. um, it is. Yeah. But it's a fascinating thing for your for fu- for a future podcast. Look into, <laughs> yeah. um, well, it's like, maybe along alongside imposter syndrome. And sure, uh, if you're stupid, do not sense imposter syndrome. But um, I th- uh, I always think that that, that you know, most good leaders, I think, are, have, have some sense of imposter syndrome how can you know oh sure yeah if you're going up the steps of downing street and passing all those um, things but dunning kruger and um can't remember his name uh, i'll look it up uh, but we so yeah. pittsburgh 1995 
Rory, do do some you you go from you know seamlessly from one voice to another. I mean, our our voices a little bit like I don't know, like countries. Do like do do tones and intonations and kind of the timbres of voices do they border on each other do 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 kind of yeah you know, is there, well is it's there funny because like... alistair mcgowan is a great impressionist he talks about voice bunkers and that's when you do slightly too much of one and you slip over into an into oh really another oh, voice, which is too close. i mean i've done a lot of trump today but you know it's not such a, tre- a stretch to go from him to louis walsh because louis walsh says i want people to vote for you and then says, yeah i want people yeah, to yeah. vote for me so all you do is you take Louis, you take that kind of that kind of pleading thing, and you add a little bit of age, you add a little bit of America, and you're there almost. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sa- uh, let, uh, Sandy Gore was what I used to. It's ten o'clock. This is Sandy Gore looking like oh, it's Sandy. much later, and that was a newsreader. But sometimes it was James Raymond Brooks Ward. It's over. Oh dear. So that's it, it's it's basically you know in your head you've got a sort of paint chart. I'll give yeah. you a good, very good I was about to say that. It's like a palette, isn't it? It's like an artist. It's like a palette. Yeah. yeah. And I'll tell you how you build up Ed Miliband. I'm now I'm talking, I'm talking British examples, but okay. Ed Miliband, Labour leader about four or five years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So you start with Tony Blair. And like I said before, you know how so many leaders after Tony Blair became, you know, they, they actually adopted that style of speaking. And Tony was like that. So it's quite civil and it's quite open. And then you take Chris Tarrant. And Chris Tarrant, who's wow. the host of who wants me yeah. to And here's with he. Okay, so <laughs> is it gonna be A? Could it be B? Could it be C? Oh, we don't want you to go. And so it was very you can hear it's kind of blocked here. And this is uh, very yeah. much blocked here. But if you have that if you have that together with Tony Blair, what you actually get is a middle man. And then I work with a voice coach, and this is about whether you can teach it or not. Oh, I was going to ask you about that, Rory. Because I started to doubt my ability, and I so I, I work wow. with a, a lovely guy, Kevin O'Shea, and um, uh, and we spoke about this, and we discovered that sometimes there's just key letters or le- words. And with with Miliband, it was leaf, wow. so you, the letter E L, so you go leaf. So sometimes I'll say, I just want to be, I just want to be the labour leader, and the labour, the labour, labour leader. And it became a, for some people's letter O for um, Malcolm Rifkin. Um, you know, I uh, adapted a song. You know, Moses supposes his toes are. So Malcolm Rifkin, who had a very distinctive the way of saying the letter O, and his became, we once wrote a line about Saddam Hussein, which says, well, that presupposes he knows we oppose his proposals. And it was nonsense. That presupposes he knows we oppose his proposals. It was just there because it gave me an excuse to do lots of those O sounds, which were my way in yeah. to, to the character. Um, Matt yeah. Ford, a good, another good impressionist. He does a very sure. good impression now. He's one of the first people to get to Keir Starmer. Ah. And he says... Okay. And the thing is, because Keir Starmer talks out of the back of his throat, and he says the way into Keir Starmer is to say the Metropolitan Police. The <laughs> Metropolitan no, I would just say the, the Metropolitan Police. And when he said, and I just text it to him every now and again, I just text him the words Metropolitan Police. Because <laughs> in Precious, that's often how you work. You just, you find a certain vowel sound. That's fascinating. Um, Alistair yeah. talks about um, yeah. Frank Skinner, the uh, the Birmingham comedian yeah. Frank Skinner. And he says, the word for him is how you get two syllables out of the word shiwa. I'm not oh, quite yeah. shiwa. Yeah. And sh- so that's often how impressionists work. I don't know whether you can teach it. I don't think, I think it's a musical ear. I think most musicians or singers, Bruce, you must be good with impressions, aren't you? Because you know you because you know what things you know the sound you want to make. You've got to hear somebody. You got to think, oh, I know what that sounds like, and be switch off, switch off the television, and hear the voice in your head, but then be able to do it. I I, I used to do our manager to his great discomfort, <laughs> uh, you know, in front of the band. So I was, you know, so, oh, you know. Oh, bloody hell, you're not bloody coming here with all that rubbish again. I, I'll tell you, I, I, I used to be able to take three navvies. I put three navvies on the end of a shovel. I said, I'm sorry. That's, that's, that's physically, it's like bloody physics, isn't it? Three navvies on the end. It's just fucking leverage, isn't it? You know, you just fucking three navvies on the end of a shovel. Where yeah. was he from? And bloody Jeff. He's from bloody Huddersfield, isn't he? Oh, bloody no. Jeff from bloody, 
Jeffrey bloody boycott. Oh, Huddersfield's yeah. interesting. Yeah, it was a cuss between Yorkshire and Lancashire. It's funny because Yorkshire's yeah, yeah, well, open well, like that, you know, like, and then he gets. Ah, yeah, so, well, he I'm, I'm, he's I'm down from, a bit for Manchester. He gets, gets, I'm from Workshop, you see. I'm from Workshop, you know. So, oh. so Workshop is just in that netherworld somewhere. It's just south of Netherthorpe, actually. Never just thought. Netherthorpe. But then, but then you go over the Pennines. Well, that's a strange world, you know. And that's where you get all the people like Rhodes, Rhodes Boyston, who used to talk um, like that about his. Oh, which is strange. Poison. He was fucking brilliant, wasn't he? Oh, that huge yeah. moustache of his and everything else like that, you know. Oh, and and there's the, the, round, the, the rounded, rounded, the rounded vowels. Oh, the rounded yes. vowels of the Man- Mancunian, like, whatever. But anyway, so, so then you go to... I always feel that Yorkshire accent is really, really unfair on, 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 on some women. I mean, for blokes, it's great. It's like, oh, Horvis, you know, yes. I buy bread from somebody that talk like that because it's bad. But, but with women, sometimes it's... It's parodied in such a way. So, oh, bloody hell, no. You don't have to put that, that in me. Yeah. You, don't, you don't have to put that in me, are you? No. <laughs> you know, I mean, so. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's almost Coronation Street, that is. He's going the other way. It is. Yeah. No, but it is. A, no, but it is. Oh, Myra. 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 Oh, she's such a Myra. Oh, she really is, you know. Honestly, you know. But I think, you know, I'm, I'm the Yorkshire, put, but it's a generally, it's good, even for the blokes, I tell the, you know, it's a bit, if people talk about, you know, they're doing a the show and I came off, went to the gents. And I heard I two Yorkshire right, right. One said, what do you reckon on comedian? And the other one said, oh, he's all right, you know, if you like right. laughing. <laughs> yeah. There's, you know, you talk about <laughs> you talk about Yorkshire accent. There's a study. Right, Shithers, we've got to make a cut here. I know. Yeah. I know this is very boring. <laughs> but there is a study go. which Put has just come out, all. which shows that at yeah. the moment, the Yorkshire accent is the most trusted accent <clears throat> in the UK. Second Sean is the Bean. Queen's English. Third is Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Thanks, Burr. Man. There you go. So, oh, well, you see, I, I oh, that's very that. nice. So the, the Edinburgh, Edinburgh Burr is very peculiar because it's, yes, it's very soft. That's very true. Velvety almost. Well, of course, no, you get Edinburgh lawyers who tend to speak a little bit like this. And I heard a story about uh, two Edinburgh lawyers who had occasion, <laughs> who had occasion to be in Glasgow. And uh, the waitress, <laughs> yeah. they summon the waitress. The waitress, they're looking at the menu in Glasgow, and uh, they examined the waitress, and waitress, waitress, uh, in this voice, which a friend of mine said, had an umlaut over every vowel. I said, waitress, uh, could you tell us, enlighten us, what is the, what is the soup du jour? <laughs> and the waitress said, um, it's the soup of the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's Glasgow, Edinburgh for you. You, Rory, uh, Rory, just one quick question. Are there good, are there, are there good starter impersonations that people can do if they're starting out? Or does it just depend, or does it just depend on where you're from? I mean, or what your oh, voice is. is. It does uh, completely. Yeah, everyone, but everyone can do Frank Spencer, can't they? Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah I can. All of, no, all of that yeah, generation. Can, yeah, yeah. yeah, you yeah. Go. Come on, Kevin, you start. Yeah, oh, Betty. Dog's done a whoopsie on the carpet. Yeah, anyone, yeah. Yeah. Oh, come on then, Bruce. That wasn't very good, was it? What, what really? You, you want me to do Frank Spencer? No. <laughs> no. The Betty. That's a very good Mick Jagger. Betty. That's Mick Jagger. Jagger. Oh. Mick Jagger. Oh, no. So, well, yeah, yeah, well, mate, you know, I mean, I remember when I was, like, running around naked with David Bowie, we were, like, you know, fencing with our willies as we were, you know, because we were all, like, Have you bisexual seen- back in the day. You know, that's before I had 15 fucking kids with six women, you know. Oh. So, Bruce, are you... Are you, are you that's going to go viral. That's going to that's <laughs> that's go viral movie. right there, yeah. <laughs> that will not make the edit. Yeah. Bruce, so have you hung around yeah. with Mick Jagger? No. No. No, I, I, I've, 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 and you never I, will I, after that, mate. No, I saw him walking past a window once. I was, um, I was, uh, I was recovering from throat cancer, and it was the first meal I'd had of, of, of actual, like, solid food. And I was a, ki- I was on the King's Road, and I went, God damn it, I'm going to eat more than a soggy croissant, you know. Yes. And I was, I'd, I'd made my way there, and I was like, right, I am definitely going to eat this bowl of cabbage soup whatever it was and i'm sat there and it took me hours to do it because it hurt like hell because it it used to get get, getting over all the radiation and shit like that and as i'm eating my cabbage soup fuck me mick jagger walked past the the window i went it's a sign (laughs) and that was it (laughs) 
Uh, Rory, mate, yeah. it's been absolutely lovely having you on. It really has. Oh, it's Kevin, been mate, it's been great. Complete joy. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to try and do it now. I don't, you know, it's considered me. No. But- Rory, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much. Way over time. Yeah. You've been very, very generous. Listen, when well, I get back you. over in November, I'll take you out for a lovely dinner. I'd um, love that. It's been it's, fantastic. Uh, and, and, uh, meet- Bruce, I'm sure you're back in November as well, aren't you, mate? So maybe we'll all go out. Oh, I am indeed. We'll all go out. Back we'll all November. have a nice dinner. Yeah. I'd love the absolute that. fantastic. Yeah, great. Fun for me to meet you. I have to say it's been an honour. So yeah. thank you very much indeed. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, you too. Cheers, Rory. Amazing. Well, thank you for being with us for another episode of Psycho Schizo Espresso. If you want to become a patron, then please do. Patreon.com uh, forward slash Psycho Schizo Espresso. And in the meantime, just don't forget if you're watching us on whatever platform, whether it's YouTube or Spotify or whatever, don't forget to just uh, give us a little nudge if you like what we're doing and like us. And that way, more people will get to hear about it and we can spread the gospel of Psycho Schizo Espresso, I think, Bruce, isn't it? Yeah. The gospel, gospel of Je ne sais quoi. Yeah, the gospel of Psycho Schizo Espresso. Folks, you won't regret it. Well, you might. But it'd be too late by then anyway. So yeah. there you go. Help us spread help us spread the news. Yes. Mm-hmm.